All right, all right. Red Nation, today we're going to talk about contrast agents in X-ray and CT imaging. What are the different types of contrast agents? How are they used? Make sure it's stay to the end to see some misnomers or things that a lot of people still believe that aren't true about contrast agents. So contrast agents are adding material in order to increase the anatomical contrast in your X-ray and CT image. It's that simple. It's just something that we add to the body while we're taking the X-ray and the CT image such that we can visualize the anatomy more easily. And there is inherent contrast in your X-ray images, especially in bony anatomy. You can really see the contrast very well. You can see high resolution structures very well in the bony anatomy because of the relative high Z of the bony anatomy, right? In lung cancer, for instance, you can see that very well. There's very good contrast in your x-ray imaging between background of more air type tissue and cancerous tissue in the case of lung cancer. These are two cases where there's good inherent contrast in your x-ray imaging. In order to improve the contrast, you have to change the x-ray attenuation. You can either change it in a negative manner or change it in a positive manner. So first off, we'll talk about changing the x-ray attenuation in a negative manner. And that can be done especially well by using air or by using carbon dioxide. Air and carbon dioxide both have a very low x-ray attenuation. They're relatively low Z and they're low in density. So though they're both things, they're going to mean they're going to attenuate your x-rays. You don't see x-rays of the brain that often anymore, but an x-ray of the brain would look something like this. Back in the day, before there was CT, we would actually do an exam that would actually add air, essentially, to displace cerebral spinal fluid. And you could then get better contrast within the brain using this negative contrast agent by using air. This was a really gruesome exam in terms of the side effects. This exam is called pneumoencephalophagy, and it is not done anymore. Nausea could go on for some time and throwing up, being disoriented. Luckily, CT nowadays gives us better contrast than this, which I'll show you in just a minute. But this shows you an example of using air as a contrast agent. The inherent contrast that we have on our CT exams significantly better than what we saw on x-ray. And you can see on a non-contrast CT of the head, you can see a lot of the soft tissues you can see that cerebral spinal fluid. You can see the white matter. The white matter is right here. You can see the cerebral spinal fluid here in the ventricles. You can see a tumor here. In the case of blood, you can see blood from the relatively recent bleed, all with the inherent contrast of the CT. But this is the case where you don't necessarily need contrast for certain types of tests. If there is a recent bleed, you can do so without actually injecting any contrast agent. But if you want to see the vessels within the CT, good luck finding all of your vessels within the CT image right here because they're very difficult because the inherent blood relative to the soft tissue is very difficult to see in those small quantities within the vessels. This is a comparison of that first exam that we talked about of using air as a negative contrast compared with the inherent contrast that you have in your CT. This is why CT is so common for many types of clinical applications because of the huge step in the inherent contrast over a standard x-ray. And another negative contrast is actually using CO2. You could use that for angiography and you can see here, vessels can actually be relatively well visualized if you take your acquisition relatively quickly. Again, the blood will fill in behind the CO2, but if you can take your acquisition relatively quickly, you can get pretty good images here using CO2 and geography. And in the case of a contrast shortage, we had some people even talking about using CO2 in order to reduce the contrast usage. CT colonography is another area where negative contrast is used. You're actually inflating the rectum here, making sure the rectum is totally full of gas so that when you do the imaging, if you're looking at a polyp, you're looking at the polyp with respect to the very low density gas that's surrounding it. That's gonna give you a better ability to visualize the polyps by having that good contrast. Those are the cases of the negative contrast agents. 
very important, but often under talked about when you're talking about contrast agents, then what we call a neutral contrast agent, it has attenuation relatively similar to our body soft tissue is actually water. You can use water, especially orally as a neutral contrast agent. And this is used sometimes in abdominal imaging. Then the positive contrast agents are really where we spend the most time actually talking about contrast. You can think about, we're gonna take this tree and go into a couple branches here. One is soluble and one is insoluble. So insoluble means it won't mix up if you pour it into water. And barium sulfate is actually an oral contrast and it's also used for enemas. It's actually used for imaging the colon and giving you a nice positive contrast. This is an example of a barium enema on x-ray. You can see the contrast relatively well given the fact that barium was used here and barium having a higher Z than the surrounding material leading to a higher x-ray attenuation here. Also barium is an oral contrast as used in CT again with lower doses but again the same kind of thing you can see very bright contrast given the barium. And this is really good for imaging of the colon. So the barium will generally clear your system within a couple of days. You'll generally have some white poop in the interim while it's clearing your system. One thing you want to keep in mind is if there are perforations in the colon, you really want to avoid this because that barium is not soluble. So it'll just be perforated out and will not have a good way to clear the body. Also, if there's blockages, you don't want to use barium because again, it's not gonna have anywhere to really go if it can't go out the normal GI system. Another case is if the patient is having difficulty swallowing it, this is a case where you're gonna to want to avoid using this type of contrast agent. There are also some potential side effects listed here, which I won't go over all of them, but they include nausea, vomiting, and finally, we'll get to iodine. And so iodine is soluble, so we can mix it up in water-like solution, and it's gonna be able to be used for imaging of the rest of the body, for instance, in the vessels or in the soft tissue themselves, in the parenchyma, we can use iodine in order to enhance the contrast. So this is why we would wanna use it. If you look at a non con exam here in the abdomen of a CT in the abdomen, and then if you look at that after contrast has been on board, so you can see the images in the vessels are improved. And as well, you can see some of the lesions actually show up better because the standard tissue in the liver is actually all getting brighter. There's multiple reasons to use contrast in order to improve the imaging in the abdomen. We could break this soluble iodine-based contrast into ionic and non-ionic. Ionic, is actually something that's basically been retired in the clinic. Ionic means that when you have the contrast agent and it dissolves, there's actually charged particles that can be generated and those charged particles actually can interact and thus there's gonna be more side effects when you're actually using an ionic contrast agent. For that reason, it's basically not used anymore. On the non-ionic branch then, we're gonna talk about another branch that we could make what we call relatively high osmolality and relatively low osmolality contrast agent. And what is osmolality? Osmolality is just the number of dissolved particles that you have in your contrast. In general, you'd like to have fewer dissolved particles. And the reason is the osmotic pressure. If we have more dissolved particles on one side of a membrane, the water is actually gonna want to get an equilibrium. You're gonna have water leaving your cells in order to try and dilute the contrast agent. In the case of a higher osmotic contrast agent, this can actually lead to, again, more side effects. So this is why we go for lower osmolality, so that's fewer particles. But if you want to have the same amount of stopping of the x-rays, then those particles themselves, they actually have to get larger, right? in order to get the same amount of iodine onto those molecules. So we now have larger particles. And then those larger particles, we have those larger par particles dissolve. That is actually gonna mean it's more viscous. So it's gonna run more slowly, more like molasses. That's why with these larger particles over time, we've evolved again from ionic 
to non-ionic to lower osmolality. Here's some of the physical properties of the iodine contrast that I've talked about. As far as osmolality, we prefer the lower osmolality type contrast. For the density, we prefer higher density, typically, contrast, such that you can get a higher CT number per the same amount of volume of the contrast. And as we talked about, these contrast agents have a higher viscosity. So one way to lower the viscosity is actually to warm them. And there's a number of potential side effects for the contrast agents. Some of these are psychological and some of these are allergic type reactions. In general, you wanna make sure you have a good medical staff ready to perform treatments, such as using epinephrine and having the crash cart ready in case there is one of these more severe reactions. One thing is that this iodine contrast is gonna go throughout your body. Typically we're using an intravenous injection in CT and an intra-arterial injection under a lot of X-ray imaging. But in both cases, that contrast is gonna be flowing through your body and then is gonna be filtered out by the kidneys. You're then gonna excrete that through your urine. So the question arises, can that contrast that's filtered out via the kidneys cause problems with the kidneys? especially if the kidneys have impaired function. There was dogma in this field for many years that acute kidney injury would be much more likely with iodinated contrast. However, it was found that the original evidence to support this was not well controlled. Namely, really sick people get more CT scans as a group. And so if you don't have a proper con to say, who's getting the CT scan with iodine and who's not in your study, you may have findings that actually show that there's a higher likelihood of the iodine causing a problem. One way to measure how well the kidneys work is to look at what we call an estimated glomerular filtration rate. And this takes breakdown of the muscle creatine and then does a blood test and the kidneys should be filtering out that creatine so if the creatine level is relatively high, this means the kidneys are not working well. In that case, it's going to have a low score on the filtration rate. So you can see the normal values of estimated filtration here, and then the values where it's basically impaired, and then the kidneys are basically not functioning. The American College of Radiology and the National Kidney Foundation support the statements here. These were pushed by a number of authors, including Davenport from University of Michigan, when this EGFR is 45 or greater, it's actually very close to 0% chance that you're going to have a kidney injury due to iodine. When you're setting your contrast protocols, make sure that you're checking the most recent literature because this is something that has evolved a lot as of late. Finally, another public service announcement, for a while, people were asking about shellfish when it came to iodine administration. There's actually no link between shellfish allergies and iodine. The actual size of the particles that are used in the iodine contrast couldn't cause an allergic reaction. It was one of those cases where there was some early ideas in the field that there could be a link, and those have lingered over time. Now you know all about the different contrasts that we have, negative, positive, air, barium, iodide. Make sure and check out our video on photoelectric and cocktail interactions if that's how the x-rays are interacting with our body in order to make the measurements in x-ray and CT.